Hi, my name is Jor and I'm speaking with Derek Jensen in an attempt to uh, explore some questions surrounding technology and our relationship to it and what this means uh, in the real physical world. Derek is a prolific author and environmental activist. He's written over 20 books uh, dealing with all sorts of topics including the environment, domestic violence and the pathology of abuse, surveillance and the history and strategies of resistance, dominant culture and the problems of civilization, as well as ways to effectively address these. Derek, thanks very much for taking time to talk with me. That's very appreciated. Hi. So, if I can rewind back to 2004, where you and George Draffin wrote this book called Welcome to the Machine, which is about science and technology and surveillance all being part uh, of the control imperative of this culture. And I guess this is an interesting time to be discussing this as we see with, um, you know, the news of, of the, the current NSA wiretapping and so on that's been going on for decades, the confirmations of that, and I guess the absolute proliferation of digital technology through the culture. Um, so I guess 10 years later on from that book, what I want to talk to you about is the, the vast surveillance state uh, that's been built up over those decades and uh, to something that we realise and some of us had realised long ago is a, is a panopticon. And I guess um, I want to explore that with you not only in terms of discussing surveillance but um, also in terms of explaining how the panopticon is a very good analogy to describe this culture um, and the way it exerts its power. So, do you want to take us through that, um, what, what the panopticon is and, and then take us through the analogy? Well, sure. And and before I say that, I want to say that the um, Welcome the Machine is a pretty is pretty interesting, in part because surveillance has changed so much in the past ten years. And when we wrote that book, there were these fairly new things called predator drones. Yeah. This was this was news at that point. And now, um, of course, predator drones are used to kill people all over and I just read yesterday that uh, Amazon.com is wanting to use drones to deliver packages within a few years and one of the things that says is just that shows how quickly this is a pattern we see all the time where something moves from almost unheard of to um, fairly accepted in every day very, very quickly. And it's happening more and more quickly. We see this with GMOs where, um, you know, at first there was this huge outcry. Oh my gosh, GMOs are going to be terrible. And then all of a sudden with no discernible transition, we move from a debate about whether GMOs should be allowed to um, people begging to at least have the food they eat be labeled as having GMOs in it. And this happens with, once again, technology after technology. It doesn't matter whether it's GMO, nanotech, um, nuclear, um, various surveillance elements. But there's, there, there can begin, there sometimes can begin to be a robust discussion of it but, it. but it's as though the discussion actually never took place because the discussion changes so quickly from should this be allowed to can you regulate it to can you please at least label it to please don't make me ingest this with every single meal. And it's and every time the negative effects that the the negative effects that are brought up end up they end up once again, every single time they don't they end up not mattering to the actual discussion. You know the the people who promote the things can be, oh none of the terrible things are ever gonna happen. And then when we find out that all the terrible things happen, or most of them, it doesn't actually matter. The same thing has happened with surveillance, that, oh, we would never misuse any of this. Oh, it ends up that actually we're recording every single email that every person on the entire planet sends. And it, it, it's stunning to me how... Stunning is maybe the wrong word, because can you keep getting stunned about something that you've seen about 500 times now? It's it's disgusting to me. I don't know what the word is, but 
But mm. we, it's a pattern that we see all the time. And we can talk about that more later if you want. But anyway, back to Panopticon. A Panopticon is a prison design by Jeremy Bentham. It was... It, it, the, the basic idea is that it's a prison design where the prison is uh, in a circle and it's radial out from center. So all the cells are picture a circle and then each cell would be along the outside of the circle and the guard house is in the center. And the key thing is that because it's at the center, the guard can see every single bit of every single cell. And there aren't any nooks and crannies. And what this means is that this, the guard can see what prisoners are doing at every moment. And then the next point is that... But the prisoners that, can't see the guard. Well, that's the next point, which is that the guard tower is supposed to be always dark yeah. and the um, cells are always lit. And what that means is that the guards, as you said, the, the prisoners can't see the guards, but the guards can see the prisoners which means, as Foucault said, that surveillance is always possible, never verifiable. And what this means is that those in power, they don't even need, need to necessarily have someone in the guard tower, because if you believe you're being surveilled, you will quite possibly act as though you're being surveilled, and you will then police yourself instead of having them police you. And this is... I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a very smart prison design, and a lot of modern prisons are designed along this. I used to work at Pelican Bay State Prison. I was a creative writing instructor. And for the most part, the actual pods themselves where the prisoners stay are in a panopticon design. There are other nooks and crannies elsewhere. And I don't mean to slam the panopticon in every way, but if you're going to have a prison, then the panopticon design... there. The newer prisons actually have a little bit less in terms of, say, prison rape because, you know, they can't haul you off into a little corner. If they're going to assault you, it's going to have to be in a, in a way, you know, in a place that is quite possibly um, under surveillance. So on a value neutral sense, it's just tremendously useful for guards. But now we get to the larger picture of it is not only a way to design a prison, it is a means of social control. And it's a larger, of course, and Foucault's, you know, I have a lot of problems with Foucault on his sexuality, and a lot of his sexual writings are pretty bad, but he was really brilliant in terms of describing the effects of living in a society that is designed along the lines of a panopticon. And him describing society as a panopticon really helped me understand the entire NSA, all of these processes where basically the rule is they can look at everything you do, you don't get to know anything they do. And that is the central governing um, rule of a surveillance state. And so this is tied in closely to technology because if you have... You know, we can talk all we want about the, uh, you know, East German surveillance state back with the Stasi, but they still weren't able to, even with all the informants, um, that's not as far-reaching as being able to surveil every single electronic communication that you have. And this is in, I mean, this, this is not only governments, but it's also corporations. I wrote something somewhere recently about how is it that on my birthday, I got spam birthday greetings from ESPN.com and a bunch of stores. And it's like, why do these places know my birthday? And now I'm going to go back to the surveillance state and say one more thing about that from the, from the governmental perspective, which is yeah. something that a lot of people throw out is, well, that's all fine, but they're just catching bad people. And so long as you aren't mm. doing bad, what do you care if they watch everything you do? Well, apart from the fact that I would prefer that they not know if I'm having sex, you know, just on principle. I do like to keep some things private. 
Um, well, that that was one thing I was going to ask you later on, because a lot of people do. I mean, there's that there's that strange line of, um, you know, if if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, which is quite silly. I mean, if one just has a quick look at, you know, recent historical memory. So I mean, I guess how does that fit into what the point you're making just then? Well, it fits right in because um, we can all. And what if what if Hitler had had the capacity mm. to fail that is currently had? Just because a government exists doesn't mean it has your best interests at heart. And just because the government says something doesn't mean that it is moral. And it doesn't mean that it is right. And so if you're not doing any but if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to hide, may be a fine thing for me simply walking down the street and not beat someone up, you know? Great. But um, what this means is the government is determining what is right. And of course the government does determine what is right often. You know, we all agree socially that one should not um, kill another human being for no reason. And we, we generally have that social compact. But even right there is part of the problem because one of the jokes I've told for years is what do you get if you cross two, if you cross a long drug habit, a quick temper, and a gun? And the answer is two life terms for murder, earliest release date 2026. On the other hand, what do you get if you cross two nation states, a large corporation, 40 tons of poison, at least 8,000 dead human beings? And the answer is retirement with full pan benefits. And that's Warren Anderson, CEO of Union Carbide. So those in power have determined that if you walk down the street and you pull out a gun and you shoot a policeman, you're going to go to prison. And they have also determined, and I actually don't have a problem with that. If somebody walks down the street and shoots a random person, I don't have a problem with them being punished. You know, something bad should happen to somebody who goes and, and kills a random person. But they have determined that if you kill... 8,000 people at least through poisoning them through Bhopal, the, the explosion of the Union Carbide plant there, that nothing's going to happen to you. It's the same with Tony Hayward of BP, that you know however many people died on the platform there, and they basically killed the Gulf of Mexico, and his punishment was he got, I think, $36 million worth of stock and you know a million dollars a year severance package when the guy should have been executed. And so my point is that we can't trust those in power to determine what is right, and we're fools if we do. Which, once again, I want to be really clear, I'm not arguing for a state where, a, a situation, a circumstance where um, there are no consequences for anything anybody does. I'm not arguing for that at all. What I'm saying is that those in power basically make laws to serve those in power. Hmm. I want to talk more about that that unequal relationship there, um, in in terms of speaking back with with technology, that um, as we see that techno culture, well, technology and especially digital technology and all the derivatives of that being a big part of this culture, um, and how we can see at every stage of so-called progress within that. Um, that those developments always lead to, say, in generally speaking, more surveillance or, or at the very least, more um, other forms of control. So can you talk about the relationship to this technology, how, how it is unequal um, and so on? I mean, who, who, who benefits from all of this? What's all of this for? Wait, what is this? What technology exactly? Well, if just say if we go back, if we're talking about surveillance, so say something like um, surveillance and technology in general. Well, first, well, surveillance technology, in, well, there's a couple things operating here. One of them is um, you, technology essentially magnifies one ability, one's ability to control and or yeah to control at a distance yeah. and it magnifies or escalates one's ability to control others and this is true 
even on a fairly small scale, that um, a gun would allow you to kill at a greater distance than a knife. And a machine gun would allow you to kill at a greater distance, well, not necessarily a greater distance, but at a greater, with a greater rate than would a hunting rifle. And a tank would allow you to, to kill even better, um, even more effectively. And the point is that, I mean, there are a few points here. One is that, well, I need to back up for a second. And we can't really talk about technology without talking about Lewis Mumford. And Lewis Mumford talked about something. He talked about a distinction between what he called authoritarian and democratic techniques. Yeah, yeah. And there's more to it than this. But part of it is a, a technic, T-E-C-H-N-I-C, is a technology does not emerge in a vacuum. And it takes a technic would be the mindset and the technology together, the, the way he uses it. And so it takes a certain mindset to invent an automobile, for example. The Talawa Indians who live where I live now did not invent backhoes. And that's not because they were stupid. It's because they looked at the world so differently that they didn't invent backhoes. Instead, their technologies consisted of salmon welcoming songs. And so they came up with ways to welcome the salmon as opposed to ways to dig up the soil. And they didn't invent chainsaws, you know? And that is... Well, can, well, can we talk about the difference between... Uh, and I've heard you speak elsewhere about this, the d a democratic technique and an authoritarian technique. Yeah, I was just going to get there once I got oh, through sorry, the... Yeah. But a technique is the interplay between society and a technology. Okay. And basically divided it into democratic and authoritarian technique. And a democratic technique, just for a quick definition, would be one that emerges from and leads to egalitarian social systems. An authoritarian technique would be one that emerges from and leads to authoritarian um, social systems. And a couple examples make this really clear. A bow and arrow is a democratic technique in that anyone can make them. The question is, can you make it in your backyard? And can you, the first question is, can you make it in your backyard? Or can someone else control you through this technology? And a bow and arrow Anybody can make them who has access to something for the string, something for the, the bow. That's not to say that you won't be terrible at making them. I and mean, your, your bow and arrow won't be crappy at first. You have to learn how to make them. But that doesn't alter the fact that no one can control your access to it. On the other hand, if you have a gun, you have to have metals. And if you have metals, that means you have to have mining, which means you have to have a smelter because you've got to work the metal. And what this means is that those who control the mind can control whether you have access to a gun. So it is an authoritarian technique because once you have a mind, that really means that you have to have slavery because nobody goes into a mine of their own accord. Mining and agriculture were really the first two primary slave-based economic endeavors. And that's because no one wants, the, the work is so incredibly hard, nobody wants to do it unless they're forced to. And so something else happens. As soon as you have guns, you start looking at the world differently. The technology affects how you look at the world. If you have a chainsaw, you look at the world differently than if you don't have a chainsaw. If you have an automobile, you look at the world differently. Not just if you personally have an automobile, but if your culture has automobiles, you look at distance differently. You know, I went into town yesterday. It's like two miles from here to town. Well, I had a car, so it's no big deal. But I got to tell you, if I had to walk the two miles, I, you know, I got, here's the deal. I got part way into town and I realized I'd forgotten something, so I came back. I have to tell you that if I didn't have a car and I had to walk, I would have thought very carefully before I left the house to make sure I didn't forget something because it's no big deal to turn around, you know, drive your car back a mile. And think about how airplanes change your perspective on distance. Think about how Skype is affecting our perspective on distance. Yeah. And not only does it emerge from a democratic... I mean, not only is a technology democratic or authoritarian based on whether you can build it yourself. Another example is that passive solar energy 
is a democratic technique because anybody can sit in the sun, anybody can align your home to the sun. On the other hand, as much as people like to say that uh, photovoltaics are all groovy, the truth is that they're also authoritarian techniques because they require mines, they require the entire infrastructure to get it to your house, they re require the um, people to defend that infrastructure. So once you have a mine, that means you have to have police in order to keep people from um, leaving the mine. You have to have uh, military to take the land for the mine in the first place. You have to have police and military to guard the entire infrastructure where you transport the materials. So it changes everything. And not only, but not only is it whether you are capable of making it yourself determines whether it's democratic, but also what it does to you. And a really good example to think about for that is the plow. But the plow, anybody can make a small wooden plow. You know, you could carve one and it'd be a pain, but you could do it. And you could pull it yourself if it's really small. But the thing is, that's really hard work. And so the plow lent itself to slavery, including non-human slavery. And it lent itself. And also, what's a plow do? What a plow does is converts, destroy the land base and convert everything to human use. And it destroys the soil over time. So what it means is it's unsustainable. Because if you destroy the soil, you can't be living there forever. You know, the Fertile Crescent was once fertile, and now it's pretty much a desert. And what this means is that if you have plows, your way of life can't be sustainable because you're going to destroy your land base, and you're going to be based on expansion, which means that you are ultimately an authoritarian technic. Because once you have a plow, that means you have to have a military in order to conquer more places because you've destroyed your land base. So that's the democratic authoritarian technique. So now back to Salem, the computer is ultimately and absolutely an authoritarian technique. And sure, we can use it to do our organizing and do all that stuff. But the truth is, A, the massive military would not be, they would not be capable of using predator drones without computer technology. And global trade would not be possible without computer technologies in the scale and way that it is right now. And so the point is that these, these, these surveillance technologies, it's not only who uses them, but it's also they are functionally authoritarian techniques, and they functionally lead to more surveillance by those in power. You can, yeah, I can, buy, you know, my, my house got burgled a bunch of times a couple of years ago, and so I bought uh, surveillance cameras to put in my house. I was able to catch the burglars. And so, yay, 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 I love surveillance because it actually helps stop, you know, the people from ripping me off. But the truth is that, I mean, A, I was protecting my property, and B, um, this, my personal use of a technology does not make the large-scale use of the technology, does not mean that the technology is useful for everybody. I mean... Yeah, it's great that I can have a computer and I can play these really cool little games or something, but that doesn't alter the fact that it's primarily used by the military. And it doesn't matter that you and I are using this for a good purpose right now. The question is, how does the technology affect society as a whole? And then there's also the question of who would be more likely to want to surveil somebody else? I mean, I'm thinking about individuals who stalk other individuals. And the truth is, I mean, think about, let's, let's say there's two people who are involved in a relationship, and then they break up, and then one of them stalks the other. And we'll say one of them uses surveillance technologies to stalk the other. The person is not being stalked. I mean, obviously, I mean, I presume at some point in your life you've been in a relationship, right? Okay, so let's say the relationship ends, and then, I mean, did you feel a particular need to watch what your former partner was doing at every moment? Did you feel a particular need to surveil your ex-lover after you broke up? Oh, not at all. He's asking me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, was, I was sort of wondering why you were sitting there thinking. About it. <laughs> anyway, the point is that the surveillance technology would be useless. In, like, in that sense, the surveillance technology would be useless to someone who didn't want to surveil somebody else. You see what I'm getting at? So... It's not, 
yeah, sure, we can have a baby cam where you see if your baby is crying and, and go in to check the baby if something weird happens. But A, that, that leads to whole other issues of having babies in separate rooms. But B, what I'm really getting at is even on a personal level, I would have no desire to surveil. I mean, you have two, part, two people who break up. One of them is a stalker, one of them is not. It's only the stalker who's going to use a surveillance technology against the non-stalker. That's my yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. And so, well, yeah, I mean, I guess you've written about this extensively elsewhere. About, um, And I, I guess that's one of the things I find really interesting with your work and your writing is about how you show the abuses and abusive dynamics um, of, of abusive relationships, of how the same is true with an abusive culture. And so that seems to be something that is built in um, definitely with surveillance, but I, I, I don't know. We're, I mean, maybe you can explain that in a bit more depth in, in, in the context of surveillance and, and digital technology. Well, that's, you know, the, the question I've been asking with all my work is, I mean, they're killing the planet. And I mean, why would you frack your own water supply? And why would you, I mean, they're killing the ocean. And, you know, all they're talking about is shopping on the news. And it's completely insane. And the only way I can make sense of any of this, I mean, that's, that's one of the central things to my, to my analysis. I think that, that you know, if, I had to, if I had to sum up, you know, what is different about my work than a lot of other people, it's that the only way I can understand the dominant culture is that it's completely insane. And to the problems we face are not fundamentally rational, and therefore they're not amenable to rational solutions. And what I mean by that is it doesn't make any sense to kill the ocean. And it doesn't make any sense to poison your own water supply. It doesn't make any sense to change the climate. And yet more people care about the score on a football game than actually the, the life of the planet. And even somebody like Richard Dawkins, I just saw this the other day. Richard Dawkins, even he thinks there's only a 50% chance that humans are going to survive for the next, um, until the end of the century. And, his, he, his concern is that science has created such powerful tools that they can kill, basically kill the planet, or at least kill off humans, and he's afraid that religious fanatics will get a hold of them. And the thing that was interesting was in the whole discussion, he never questioned the wisdom of making tools that are powerful enough to kill everybody. I mean, that's nuts. Just that notion. Why would you, you know, I read this. I read this uh, science fiction story when I was a teenager. It always stuck with me. And the story is about, I don't remember who wrote it, but it's about these two friends who, one of them is works on nuclear missiles, making nuclear weapons, and the other guy is an anti-nuke activist. And the guy who, has the, who makes the nuclear missiles, he has a child, he has a, like a teenage son who is developmentally disabled. And... Um, has the mind of like a six-year-old and at some point they're just talking 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 and having their familiar political disagreement and then the, the guy who's the anti-nuclear activist in this short story the guy who's the anti-nuclear activist says i'm going to go see your son and then i'm going to leave i'm like i'm going to go on home now and so he goes and sees his son for a second then he leaves and then the guy, the other guy goes and he's going to go to bed so he goes and checks on his son and he sees that the anti-nuclear activist has given his son a gun and his son was sitting there playing with a gun. And the last line of the story is, what sort of madman would give a gun to someone with the mind of a six-year-old? And of course, the whole point was about nuclear weapons. And the fact that this nuclear scientist was essentially doing that. I'm not saying we have the mind of a six-year-old and we have to grow up. What I'm saying is that this culture is stark raving mad. And it's, it's killing the planet. And... So when people talk about, oh, like this person just wrote to me not very long ago and said, well, gosh, if we just had an economic system where everybody got paid full value and we all just make, you know, happy decisions with each other, then everything will be fine. And I was like, you know, why would those in power pay everybody what they're worth? You know, those in power, what they're about is seeking extra power and they want to increase their power and they are addicted to power. And it's really clear. See, there's the next step of, of Mumford's authoritarian techniques. 
is that it's not just that it leads to an authoritarian culture, the technology and, and the technique, but instead his definition of it is really that the technology itself becomes authoritarian, that the technology itself becomes in charge, that it's not, there's one of my favorite lines and one of the most horrible lines from Welcome to the Machine was um, Frederick Winslow Taylor, talk, he's the guy who came up with the tailorization of various processes by which it meant that like at McDonald's, you don't have one person make the whole burger. You have one person who flips the burger, somebody else who puts the burger on the bun, somebody else who puts the hamburger in the bag, and that's a more efficient process. And he had this great line about, and excuse the sexism, in the past the man was first, in the future the system shall be first. And that's, we're definitely, we've been there for a long time, but that's where we're at is the system is actually in charge. It's not, yeah, we can talk about the rich getting richer, but it's a compulsion. It's an addiction. It's completely insane, and it is entirely out of human control. And yeah, 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 we humans make choices, but if you've ever known an addict, we know that addicts don't always make we can talk about them having choice, but isn't it funny how every day they choose to feed the addiction? Addiction comes from the root, meaning the same root, root as eat it, like a judge will give an eat it. And it comes from the root meaning to enslave, because what they originally worked was a judge would enslave someone. I, you know, you commit a crime, and so now I'm going to, as a punishment, as my edict, you are now addicted. You are a slave. You are enslaved to this other. And... The problem is, we've all heard the cliche that addicts don't quit until they hit bottom. And we've, I'm sure we've all known addicts who have not quit until they hit bottom. The problem is that when you are addicted to power over others, it's not you that hits bottom, but everybody else. This is why perpetrators of domestic violence almost never change. Because they're actually receiving tangible benefits for their abuse. Yeah, they're destroying relationships, but if somebody demands sex and the other person doesn't give it, and the first person beats the hell out of the second person, the next time the first person demands sex, it may be forthcoming, and they may be able to get a willing victim. And it's the same with cleaning, cleaning the dishes. You know, if one time the kid says, I don't feel like cleaning dishes, and the parent beats the hell out of the kid, the next time the kid's probably not going to say, I don't feel like doing the dishes. And yeah, they've destroyed the relationship, but they have, but they don't have to worry about the dishes. They've got a slave. And that's the whole point is to create slaves. And this is, this, to show how deeply this is embedded in our culture, there's this great line by Richard Dawkins about, um, this is a direct quote. Science bases its claims to truth on its spectacular ability to make matter and energy jump through on command and to predict what will happen and when. And that's an extraordinary statement because what he has done is conflate our ability to know what is true with the ability to dominate. Because he's saying science bases its claims of truth on its spectacular ability to make matter and energy jump through on command and to predict what will happen and when. So let's say you and I are in the same room. And let's say I have a gun. And let's say there's a hoop right here. And let's say I say to you, Jor, on the count of three, you're going to jump through that hoop or I'm going to shoot you. And then on the count of three, what do you know? You jump through the hoop. What do you know? I'm a fucking genius because I just predicted when you were going to jump through the hoop and you did it. And I just forced you to jump through a hoop on command. But the thing is, if I put a gun on you and I forced you to do things, do you think you'd like me? I mean, don't you think that might destroy any possibility of friendship? Mm. So that my point really is that this culture, the ability to dominate, not the ability, the the impulse to dominate is so deeply held in this culture that it's in our very epistemology, how we know what's true. And once again, the capitalists are not going to change. And the reason they're not going to change is because they're not the ones suffering. They're doing very well, thank you very much. They just drink bottled water while everybody else drinks the fracked water. And meanwhile, the oceans are dying. Everybody else is hitting bottom but it's not everybody else who has to change because it's those in power, which is, you know, this is, this is moving beyond the topic of this, this particular discussion, but 
the reason I am end up being so militant in my work and calling for people to bring down civilization is not because I'm personally a violent guy. I'm I have never the last time I got in a fight was in eighth grade. Um, you know, I don't I am personally very mellow. I, I was doing an interview one time, and partway through the interview, it was a, in person, it was a, for a radio station, partway through the interview, the people who were interviewing me just started laughing, and they said, we expected you to be pounding on the table and spitting. And it's like, no, I'm a fairly calm guy. It's just, the world is being killed, and those in power aren't going to stop. You know, one of the, a review somebody did of one of my work, of one of a review somebody did of one of my books one time had one of my favorite lines anybody's ever written about me. And that was, they said that I was almost pathologically unsentimental. And I love that. You know, it's, it's not unemotional, but unsentimental. It's like, I got no attachment to, to civilization. I got no attachment. Yeah, I'm using a computer, but I got no attachment to it. And, you know, Buddhism came in for quite a thrashing in my, in my book Endgame. But part of the problem is because, I mean, I think the whole non-attachment thing is really smart. It's just so many people use it the wrong way. They say, oh, you can't be attached to the salmon and you got to let everything go. It's like, fuck you. That's not what it's about. What it's about is about not being attached to a car. I can still drive a car because I live in a fucking car culture. But I want for car culture to end. I'm using this computer here. But, you know, if the Internet went down tomorrow, I would be so delighted. And, yeah, I'd be bummed just like everybody else. But... You know, and I would, but then I would get over my addiction. You know, did you ever see the movie? I know we're getting way way afield, but did you ever see the movie The Truman Show? Yeah, I love the very very end of the movie where, you know, they've been watching this Truman Show for years and years and years, and then the two guys sitting in the parking lot, all they do, you know, everybody's worried. Oh my God, what's going to happen if if this show ends? It's the biggest show on TV, and it ends, and basically they say, well, is there anything else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like. (laughs) All this stuff, you know, we can't afford to lose clean water. That's my problem here. We can afford to lose football games. You know, I like sports well enough, but honestly, that's not necessary. We've forgotten what's necessary, and we're getting way to hell afield. But um, it's okay. It's okay. It's getting back good. to the question of abuse, yeah, the same dynamics that work in an abusive family, I think, work on a larger scale. One of the great things, R.D. Lang wrote these wrote the three rules of a dysfunctional family. Rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist, and rule A2 has never discussed the existence or non-existence rules A, A1, or A2. And what this means within, within an abusive family is you can talk about anything you want in the world, except for the abuse you have to pretend isn't happening. You can't talk about the fact that dad beat the hell out of, you know, junior. You can't talk about the fact that mom's an alcoholic. You can't talk about any of that stuff. You can talk about football. You can talk about, I don't know, on a larger scale, you can't really talk about the real effects of global warming. We can't talk about any of that stuff. We can talk forever about how many people bought neat gizmos on on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving here. You know, we can talk about all this stuff around the edges. We can't talk about what's really happening. The same dynamics play out every time. And it's the same. You know, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite parts of Endgame is where I write, it's premise four, which is um, this culture is based on rigidly, rigidly defined yet often unarticulated hierarchy. And violence under those higher on the hierarchy, those lower is often completely invisible. And when it does happen, it's fully ra- I mean, when it does when it is noticed, it's fully rationalized. On the other hand, violence blowing up the hierarchy is unthinkable. When it does happen, it's met with shock, horror, and the fetishization of the victim. And the same thing is true with surveillance. It's only allowed to flow downhill. It can't flow uphill. That's the that's the basically premise four of Endgame is just the physical violence version of a panopticon. And this is central to all abusive cultures. All the shit flows downhill. All the good things flow uphill. Another way to say all this is, um, and this is a line George Draffin came up with that I then have used quite a bit, but I love his line about the corporate culture and the corporate economy is based on the privatization of profits and the externalization of costs. And that's just another way of saying this whole thing, that the good stuff goes toward the center of the panopticon and the bad stuff goes to the out. That's all. We've done the whole culture. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you another time. You know, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Well, maybe we can just briefly talk about um, some of the endless examples of how technology impacts on the natural world, um, and is you know destroying cultures, destroying land bases. 
or all of the stuff that's, you know say for example the Congo or something all, all of that stuff the endless stuff that um, we never talk about but that's the point sort of tacking on to just the last thing you've said maybe we can talk a, a little bit more about that so why is that why, why is it that we don't talk about that well there's a couple of reasons one is the um, the Artie Lang quote I just said another is because we're bought off but um, you know, I think about, you know, what do all the so-called solutions to global warming have in common? What they all have in common is they take industrial capitalism as a given, and the natural world is that which must conform to industrial capitalism. And that's literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality. And the reason I bring that up is because it is literally true that even most environmental activists can picture the end of the world more than they can picture the end of, end of capitalism or the end of civilization. And there is a... I mean, I've, gotten, I've done interviews before with environmentalists who say... Um, You know, what's going to happen with the, end of the, with the end of oil, which will be the end of the world? And it's like, no, actually. You know, the end of oil would, would actually be the end of civilization. A continuation of the oil economy is the end of the world. And this is environmentalists just who are saying this. Mm. And one of the reasons we don't talk about this <coughs> is because we get a bunch of goodies. I mean, it's actually pretty cold here today, for here. I live, I live in temperate rainforest, so... It gets down, it's, it's just about freezing. And, you know, Crimea River, that's not really very cool. But the fact is that I'm sitting inside and I'm warmer than if I would have been living here 300 years ago. And also, you know, if I want, I can have ice cream tonight. And um, we, we've been bought off by all of these goodies. We get access to ice cream 24 so, no, After Fukushima, a Japanese minister of energy said that of course they have to keep going with nuclear energy because we cannot imagine living without electricity. And that's extraordinary because even now, most of the people, most of the humans living on Earth live without industrial gen elect industrially generated electricity. Hmm. And in fact, industrially generated electricity if the electrical grid went down tomorrow, the poor people in India would be better off immediately. The poor, the, I'm sorry, the poor people, the rural people, people in cities would be completely screwed. But the rural people would be better off. Years ago, I asked Anurad Mittal, former director of Food First, if the people of India would be better off if the global economy disappeared. And she laughed and said, of course, the poor, the world over would be better off. And the examples she gave were that there are former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. So the global economy is killing people everywhere. I mean, especially in the non-industrialized nations, in the colonies. And what about some examples specific to technology, though? Say, like e-waste in the Congo and, and such, such like, blah blah blah. Um, wait, are you talking about the? Um, uh, just, just the. the what, what's the, what's the stuff that they use for the for the? I think you just said it, but I couldn't hear it. What's the stuff they use for the cell phone? Oh, coltan. Yeah, coltan. Yeah. I mean, there are how many people have died? See, that's the thing is when the thing people also ignore a lot of times. A lot of these regional conflicts, they can talk about tribal difficulties or whatever, but they never they never implicate the real problem, which is the global economy. And people are not. Um. They're, they're, for the most part, not killing the other people over um, over their their the reason these conflicts happen is because there are resources that are being stolen by the people in the industrialized nation and that will drive a lot of those conflicts. I mean, this is, this is one of the things that kills me, is that a lot of, especially environmental activists, don't understand something that every military person ever understands, which is 
the role of resource extraction in military conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the reasons that we can talk all we want about Hitler having this idea that the Russians were subhuman, but the real reason he invaded, there were two real reasons. One of them is because they wanted access to the grain and to the land in Russia, and the other is the Russian border was too close to the oil fields of Plutsky in Romania. And he wanted to push them back and to, to take their oil fields in southern Russia. I mean, that's in the Caucasus. And resource extraction is central to, to um, conflicts everywhere. And it's not... And even if you really like your cell phone, that doesn't alter the fact that Coltan has been a major driver of massacres in the Congo. And that doesn't mean that you personally need to not use a cell phone. That's not the point. That's a personal capitalist solution to a social problem. And there aren't any personal solutions to a social problem. What we need to do is to destroy the entire system that allows the Coltan to be removed in the first place. And the same is true for the other various high-tech things. But that I don't know if you've seen pictures of the horrors that are rare earth mining. It's it's completely devastating. So you can have you and I can have groovy little windmills or groovy um, solar photovoltaics, but that came at the cost of a landscape over there. It's just exporting the problem. This, I I have no patience for all those bright green types who say we need to switch everything over to solar because well, well this sorry yeah this this is what it, this is what i wanted to close with um um to to talk about the the deus ex machina if you like um the myth that the technology um is just going to save the day you know more, more of the same on this traject trajectory um, will solve some of these problems, and I mean, this isn't even, and one that you allude to in the book too. This isn't even an extreme example. One with, say, something called transhumanism, where the goal there is that um, one augments their body with technology, with the goal to to physically do away with the body, to become the computer in totality, and that's seen as. Um, Firstly, you know, a realistic and tenable solution to um, things like climate change and uh, 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 overshooting population, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then, yeah, we can talk about other things. Uh, say, even if we were to convert the world to solar panels in terms of the supposed source of sustainable energy. I mean, th this thinking isn't realistic, is it? It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Well, it... it it, it can't work, and part of the reason it can't work is because... So what do you think of all that? What's So, yeah, I mean, maybe this is an opportunity for you to bash hope, and I know, you, I know how you like doing that, so maybe you can do that. I, I think... Well, I want to I want to address the transhumanism thing for a minute. Okay, I mean, yeah, sure. The bad... Well, two things. One about transhumanism is it's, it's part of the same old body-hating tradition of this culture that and it's also do you know the um the great chain of being no chain of being is a is a, is a western notion and it it has been used and, and really flogged by the christians for a long time that basically there's a great chain of being and you start at the top with god and then come angels and then come men and then women and then so-called primitive and then you move down to animals, and then you move to plants, and then to, I don't know, rocks, and then sand, and then soil. And basically, it's, those at the top are perfect, and those at the top are imperfect. And at the bottom are imperfect. And it's obviously very body-hating, because God is completely abstract with no body. And down at the soil, according to this notion, is all body, no soul, no, no intellect at all. And I completely reject the whole thing. But the point is that in many ways science has just converted that over. Now instead of God, it's abstract scientific law. And instead of angels being above God, between God and humans, now it's machines. Because machines, of course, don't make human error. And they live forever. And then there's humans, and then there's you know non-humans. And it, it goes the same. But, but this whole thing is just bunk. And yeah. 
So first off, it's the whole transhumanism thing is very body hating. I don't know. I mean, I actually like having a body, and also it's also very. It, it goes along with the whole panopticon. The whole things only flow one direction because part of my payment for having this wonderful experience of being alive is that I have to die and I have to feed others. And they're saying that they don't want to feed others. And but but the, but beyond all that, I mean, of course, the transhumanists are completely insane. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I have really bad news for all of us, which is that it has already happened because a machine is not just a physical thing like this computer, but a machine is also a social structure. A machine is a device to generate power, really. And one of Lewis Mumford's brilliant observations was that you can organize your society in a way to make power, too, where people are cogs in the machine. And that is a... And he talked about the first sort of mega machine where back a long time ago. Some of them built a, built a pyramid, which, by the way, are tombs. And he was very clear that the machine is ultimately interested in death. And it's no big surprise that those were tombs, and now the culture's killing the planet, because that's the end point of this control, is death. Because I can't control this wonderful... I mean, there are bears who live here, and they come by, they rip off part of my... rip apart part of my mom's... Uh, uh, garage door the other day. And that's what bears do. I mean, you can't control them. They're wild beings. And they do whatever the hell they want. And that's the thing about wild creatures is they don't act. They don't, they don't do, they're not like a machine and you can, you can't turn them off and turn them on. They're not a, they're not a vacuum cleaner that if you turn it on, it works and you turn it off and then it sits there. Another being is, is another being. And, it's much easier to control a parking lot than a forest, which is one reason this culture is converting everything to a flat uniformity. But that's, that's, that's not really where I want to go with this. Where I wanted to go with this is that we are already inside the machine. And this is true socially, and it's also true socially with our interpersonal relationship. I mean, right now, how many machines are within um, 15 feet of you? I got a computer, I got electric light, I got stereo, um, I got another light, I got another light, uh, you go over there, I got a refrigerator. You know, that's just the start. These are machines that I interact with daily. On the other hand, how many wild animals do I have a daily relationship with? You know, last year there was a bear. I mean, there, there's been bears here. Both my mom and I have very close relationship with these bears. We, we see them usually outside or inside. But there was a bear last year. <clears throat> I've known this bear for years. And there were probably a half dozen times where she was walking next to me in the forest. And she's literally walking like five feet away from me. And I had pepper spray just in case. but Which is weird too because I'm carrying pepper spray. But the truth is a lot of her children have been killed by my neighbors, you know? She hasn't killed any of my children. I don't know any children, but she hasn't killed any of my relatives. You know, but I'm the one who's scared of her when she's actually had a relative. But the point is, I will never forget for the rest of my life walking next to a bear. That was a one time, you know, that was just one, it happened a bunch of times that summer, but that's sort of a once in a lifetime to have that relation with a bear. It's like every fucking day I got a computer. I got, you know, that's not, we have more. Here's, here's the thing. And I challenge you, and I challenge people listening to this to think about this too. I touch plastic more than I touch human flesh. That's messed up. That's really messed up. And part of the reason that we don't care about the natural world, we as a whole, is because it's not what's important to us. And you fight for what is important to you. And on a the level of survival, one of the things that has happened is that we have come to believe that our food comes from the grocery store. And our food actually does come from the grocery store. And that's why we will defend this system to the death, because our lives depend on it. And our water comes from the tap. But if our water came from a river, and if our food came from a land base, we would never allow any of this stuff to happen. 
that's one reason that indigenous peoples have so often fought back and and we right now are not fighting back quite so much is because we've been more fully metabolized into the system excuse me and so so many indigenous people have said to me the first and most important thing we have to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds and one of the things that means to me is that we need to separate ourselves from the machine that doesn't mean that i can't use a computer that's once again there are no personal solutions to social problems what it means is i need to to detach see it's all really insidious because the logic of the system is really the logic itself is inescapable once you buy into it and if i have a choice i mean let's say i'm going to buy let's say that i'm going to use a computer let's just say that's a given for now and let's say i have a choice between buying two identical computers one of them was made in thailand and the workers are all being systematically poisoned and it costs two hundred dollars the other one is made by union members in the united states who get health care and the conditions are much better and this one costs 1250 which computer am i probably going to buy mm. and sure i can personally buy the 1250 dollar computer none of these exist by the way the computers are actually made but let's pretend um i can personally do it but on the larger social scale, that's not going to happen because the logic is so compelling. And most people are not going to do that. And if we're going to pretend, oh, we're going to say, oh, well, let's pretend that everybody buys the right computer. Well, if you're going to do that, why don't we go ahead and pretend that everybody decides that the whole thing is crap and they go take down dams? You know, if we're going to fantasize, let's fantasize big. My point is not everybody's going to do that because the logic is really compelling and it's really addictive. And once you get, <clears throat> we saw this, I just actually wrote this today that we saw this with with what happened to the peoples in North America that a steel pot is a really handy thing and it's much more convenient than the clay pot or the the reed pot or the the bladders of mammals that they would use to heat like water that's how you would heat water is you would you would take an elk bladder or a bison bladder and you would fill it with hot rock and you'd have then some, some hot water that you could use to, to cook or whatever. And the point is, the steel pans were incredibly convenient. And that was one of the reasons that a lot of the indigenous peoples would participate in the um, fur economy, which helped to decimate the fur-bearing mammal. And of course they were being attacked. I'm, not in, I'm in no way suggesting they weren't victims of the culture, because of course they were victims of the dominant culture completely genocide is being committed against them. But in addition, it's really addictive and it's really seductive to want to have a steel pot because it's very convenient. And it's very easy to get sucked into the system, especially if your own culture is under assault. And this is something we see today all over the world that you get, um, who was it who wrote about, uh, oh, I've got a friend actually, who I can't remember the name of the ballad, the Hunza Valley. I've got a friend who spent some time in the Hunza Valley in Pakistan when she was young. She's Pakistani. And she, um, she said that the Hunza Valley, they wanted to keep the roads out because they knew that as soon as the roads came in, their culture was going to get destroyed. And the roads came in, and the culture is not the same as it was then. It's become much more commercialized. It's not as slow as it used to be. And when they have their local culture destroyed, the dominant culture is able to step in to use, um, you know, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine idea. It destroys the local culture and then provides these, these alternatives. And that is very, very seductive. It's very addictive. Um, I've gotten way the hell off. Um, so what was your question? Well, I just wanted to wanted you to, to go through, and you have in part, I guess, go through the 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 myth that this trajectory of technology oh, yeah. will, will save the well, day. So that's part of the problem. I don't actually talk about uh, technology advancement anymore. What I talk about is technological escalation. Okay. What these tech, um, you didn't use that word. I'm not chiding you or anything. I'm just saying that I've changed in my usage because what technology, what these technologies do, is they escalate one's ability to control and one's ability to control the natural world. And I don't understand how technologies that emerge 
from a human supremacist perspective and that technologies that are aimed at maintaining the dominant culture are supposed to save the natural world when it's the dominant culture that's killing the natural world. Paul Kingsnor talks about this. I think it's really important that when did environmentalism, so much environmentalism become not about saving the real world, but instead about maintaining the social structure. Because for, I mean, Bill McKibben is very explicit that he is doing his work in order to save civilization. He's not doing it to save the ocean. He says this time and again. He says, we need to save civilization. And he's not alone. I'm not blaming Bill McKibben. It's the same for all the so-called pioneers. You know, it's the same for all that group, what I call the ecological intelligence, or not the ecological, but the environmental intelligentsia. That it's all the same thing. It's about protecting this way of life, which is, I mean, the way to break out of this mindset is really easy. It's just say, if you were, it, just ask, what would blue whales want? Would blue whales want for you to put in solar panels? Is that going to help them? Would bats want you to put in a solar panel? Would birds want you to put in a solar panel? What about the what about the the native plants who live at the site of the rare earth mine? Do they want you to put in solar panels? You know, that's the way to to, to really break through all this for me is to say, if salmon could take on human manifestation, what would they want? And if um, red-backed voles could take on human manifestation, what would they want? What would they do? If they could take on human manifestation, what would they do to help the red-backed voles? It's really simple. Does Do these technologies help the ocean? Tell me. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw this out, but this is, this, is, this is not a question for you at all. I'm not, this is a very angry question, but I'm not mad at you. It's like, tell me how... Um, tell me how hybrid vehicles help um, help anchovies. Tell me how they help Arctic terns. They don't. It's, it's, this is, these technologies... And the, same, and the same is true with, with solar panels and all of those other uh, technologies that are, that are the purported sustainable <laughs> solution to keep going on the trajectory that we're going, yeah? When the question, once again, the question always to ask, and this has to do with abusers too. And this is a this is a very interesting question. One of the things that that Lundy Bancroft Actually, he wrote in my mind about about he wrote about abuse and really helped me understand some stuff. But one thing he understood helped me understand is, you know, I used to think that abusers would lose control and they just they lose their temper and they start punching people. And he asked a question, very simple question. So how often do abusers lose lose their temper and go punch a cop? Really. No, what they're always doing is punching the wife, punching the kid. They're not, they're not punching their boss. And it's the same. When they destroy things, when they get, when they start going around the apartment and just breaking everything, are they breaking their own stereo? Huh. What do you know? They're actually breaking other people's stuff. And so his question is always, who benefits and who's harmed? And that's the thing with these technologies is it just, it makes me so angry when people say, oh, like there was this, this article not very long ago that they said, destroying the desert to save the earth. And the article is about how this big swath of, of desert was being taken over and destroyed to put in solar panels. And it's like, wait a second. The solar panels, that's not saving the earth. It's generating electricity for industry. They've, they've conflated saving the earth with generating electricity for industry. And that's crap. And that's one of the things I think we desperately need to do is we need to not allow them to get by with those lines. That is not saving the earth. What that is, once again, is generating electricity for industry. The, the desert tortoises don't need to have electricity. Who does need to have electricity is the owner of a factory of, you know, a, a factory that's making computer chips. And so what I think, for me, the first step around all this stuff is start to actually have to switch our loyalty away from, remember the, the, the thing that Frederick Winslow Taylor saying about in the past the man was first, in the future the system shall be first. What we need to do is to make it so the land base is first. Because without a healthy land base, this is one of the things that kills me about all these people who believe that, that the world has to... to conform to capitalism is without a living planet you don't have anything 
So the living planet has to be first, and it has to be the most important, and it has to be, that's the difference between the technologies of the Talawa, to tie everything back together, the technologies of the Talawa, who lived here for 12,500 years at least, is their technologies were created with the help of the land as primary. And they were created, it's very simple. You know, a lot of people have said, Charles, man, I hate his, I, I hate his work. He's written that, you know, the Indians affected the land base too, and so basically anything goes. He literally says anything goes in terms of how humans modify the planet. And that is such a lie because the big difference is, many differences, one of the differences is that you make different land use decisions if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years than if you're not. And if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years, you would never put in a dam. You wouldn't put in solar photovoltaics. You wouldn't do any of this stuff. If you're planning on living here for 500 years, you take care of the land. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Maybe one thing, if I, if you have time, I'd ask you to tack on the end of that is, um, say, with the solar panels example, then um, that personal change doesn't equal social change. So I mean, yeah, sure, it's a good thing to install your your solar panels or whatever, isn't it? But it's not gonna it's not gonna remove um, uh, in, all of those industrial processes that that are that are killing the planet. Yeah. Well, we can we could actually have an interesting discussion about whether it's actually helpful or not. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. It's like hybrid vehicles. You know, my mom has a, has a Prius and that doesn't alter the fact that I'm not actually, I mean, they actually produce more. If you count the pollution that's created in the pollution that's generated in the creation of the vehicle, it actually generates more pollution than a regular car because pollution comes more than just out of the tailpipe. So I'm not actually sure that the photovoltaics are any better. They may or may not be. Yeah. But the real... What? Yeah, no, keep going, yeah. But the real point is that, I mean, like, I personally I personally live pretty simply, but that's mainly because well, I'm a cheap skate. It's, well, it's, <laughs> but that's what I was going to get to. I mean, it's, that's another thing in one of your books, the, what is it, the 50 ways to stay in denial or something. I mean, there's nothing wrong with living simply, but... Um, yeah, sure. It's like... Yeah. I have this obsession about, well, two obsessions. One of them's about paper and one of them's about clothes. That I can't throw away a piece of scratch paper until I've used all of it. So I have these huge piles of scratch paper, accumulation, I have like a 10 year supply of scratch paper. And this is not actually helping for us. All this is, is me, obs- me manifesting some form of obsession. And the same with clothes. I can't throw away old clothes. So actually, I recently, recently converted, okay, I am 52. I recently converted my last shirt that I had when I was in high school to a rag. I mean, I, I wear shirts and tell you that they're way too small or they're literally falling apart. This actually does not help anybody. It's just, and then when I'm done with them, I, I, I put them in the forest or I put them in a worm bin. You know, I, I, and I'm all pleased and I'm just self-righteous as hell about it. But it doesn't do a goddamn thing. You know, this is not... I don't pretend. I'm not really self-righteous about it. I'm actually kind of embarrassed. But it's, I don't pretend that this is, this is actually doing anything. And it's a very capitalist notion and a very neoliberal notion to believe that there are personal solutions to social problems. Mm. And it's completely... I mean, can you imagine somebody saying, well, my solution to slavery, this is 1830 in the United States, my solution to slavery is I'm not going to own any slaves. Well... Great. And you know what? I'm living in Nazi Germany in 1938. I tell you what, I am not going to kill a single Jew. That'll show them. I mean, but we buy this logic when it comes to environmentalism. It's just, it's just, it's just extraordinary to me. Um, and I'm not saying people shouldn't live simply. I, you know, it's like live as simply as you want. Like I said, I, I live fairly cheaply, but mainly that's just being me being cheap. It's not, it's got nothing to do with, I, I don't pretend it has to do with social change. And yeah, doing things, I think it's really important that, I mean, I try to help the local land base as much as I can. And I think that's really important. But I also fully recognize that unless this culture is stopped, that's not going to, that's not ultimately going to be 
Okay, I want to be really clear. The, I don't have a lot of patience for the whole living simply makes social change, but at the same time, I think it's absolutely crucial that we do act how we can on personal levels in terms of, you know, if nobody thinks, I mean, if say there is somebody who is, who is say there's a woman who has been raped, and it can be really important to help her go through her grieving and to be there for her and talk to her and listen to her and, and help provide a safe space for her to recover from it. That's all really important. But we also have to recognize that that doesn't stop the larger rape culture. So my point is that, yeah, I think it's really crucial. And I love, I am so excited when people rehabilitate land. You know, if they, if they, if like, I know some people who've done, who are doing great work to help restore prairie or help restore forests. I think that's incredibly important work. But we also have to recognize that by itself, that we also need to stop this culture. And it's the same true. That's why I started with a lot of this environmental stuff is that it's the same. I was doing timber sale appeals and helping to protect forests and all these other people were doing it too. But we all recognize that it's not sufficient for us just to protect it for another couple generations of bobcat or lynx or grizzly bear before ultimately the forest gets cut down. You know, we, once again, it's crucial to do this other work, but it's nowhere near sufficient because we have to look at the larger picture too. And we have to destroy the whole panopticon. That's really the point. Hmm. That's probably a good place to close. It's Thanks. funny how we say we got off topic, but you know, really it's, I guess it's all, it's all so interconnected. It's hard not to. Oh, but yeah. Yeah. If we just go all over the place. Yeah, totally. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you speaking with well, me. Oh, yeah, I appreciate it, too. I, I think you're doing really great work, and I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. And um, let me know when it's up, and I'll, I'll put a link to it, and then also, uh, you know, we can do it again sometime. Sure, I'd like that. That'd be great. Okay, great. I hope you have a great day. Yeah, you too. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.